can in, in the camera, can you say your first and last name and the proper spelling of your name? Stephen Henderson, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. All right, Steve, once again, thank you for doing this here. Um, let me start off by asking, what is your ethnicity? What is your, your you know, what is your nationality? Well, I'm African American. Um, I uh, was born in 1949, uh, and I was probably born colored. And when I went to school, in elementary school, I was probably a Negro. And by the time I got to high school, I was an Afro-American. And then by the time I got to college, I was a Black American. And then by the time I got through all that school stuff and all them labels and listening to all that stuff, I uh, understood I was an African American because of my ancestry. My ancestry is African. And um, then, of course, there's all that other stuff in there with uh, uh, Irish and uh, Scotch or uh, uh, Philippine or something like that. I don't know. I haven't gone through the, <clears throat> I haven't gone through the Henry Louis Gates uh, uh, trace. But uh, uh, I know the McKinley, my middle name's got to come from somewhere. But my brother was into that. My brother was deep into that. And he traced us back to a plantation in Georgia, one side of the family, and the rest of them to a spot in Arkansas. But my great, 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 great grandfather, something like that, you know, was uh, uh, somebody that, you know, looked out there and, and saw that he owned that woman and uh, he was going to do something with her. And just, uh, you know, so he went on out there and had his way with her. So there's some that came that way, you know. And, uh, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, and then there was uh, those that started a town in Oklahoma, uh, 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 Boley, Oklahoma. I had a, a, a grandfather, his father, great grandfather, who uh, was part of the founding of that black town in Oklahoma. And, uh, and they, were, they were, you know, all the colors in, 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 uh, from black extended out. To, to red because there were some native people that were involved in that too. So, uh, but I mean, in terms of what I consider myself, what I identify to be is an African-American because an American is, a, is an amalgamation of everything on the planet. It's the last country developed on the planet, if you understand. All the rest of the world had been developed and then they came over and they discovered North America and like they say they discovered it and found a whole lot of people here, but they claim they discovered it. But when America became the part of what they discovered, it was the last developed country on the planet. So it's really uh, very important uh, that Brother Gene Toomer, uh, who wrote the book Cain, he, he talked about that, about how the uh, American is the final development of humans on the planet. And African-Americans uh, definitely uh, uh, probably the crown of that. And it's interesting to me, uh, because all the scientists, all, they all figured out that the Garden of Eden, if such a thing as this, that the beginning of civilization had to be along the Nile and the Euphrates, and it had to be in that climate. It had to be in the African place. And then for the whole history of the world to come around to where our people were enslaved and brought into America and mingle with every other people that came from all over the world, uh, that this is the, the crown of the end of the development of the species on the planet is some sort of a poetic justice inside that. It's something, it's something to be understood by that, uh, that, that it began, the civilization began in, in, in the cradle of Africa, and that this last great human experiment in America uh, has Africans a very, very important part of it, uh, although they were brought here in a very fucked up way. Uh, uh, but they're a major part of the development of the last human experiment on the planet Earth. So I call myself African-American. Now, uh, also because of my association with Amiri Baraka, uh, 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 last time I was talking with Amiri, I was talking to him about all these labels. I say, hey man, you've been a communist and a socialist and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a cultural nationalist and a dialectical materialist and a this and a that. And he had all this stuff. And I say, well man, what, uh, what, do, you, what do you consider yourself to be now? And he said, uh, he said, brother, I'm a revolutionary optimist. And uh, I, I, I said, why is that something? He said, because today, with things as bad as it is today, it is revolutionary to be optimistic. 
And he said, I'm optimistic about the human condition. I'm optimistic about all the affairs of humans. He said, I, I have to be a revolutionary optimist. And uh, so I consider myself an African-American revolutionary optimist. Well, you know, not in my neighborhood. <laughs> you know what I mean? There were places that uh, I would go and I could tell that they were a little more accepting, but not where I grew up and not in my own family because I was, uh, and I didn't grow up with my mother and father. I grew up with, uh, 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 you know, a, a family that brought, took me in. They were no relation to me at all. But, uh, but I had family that lived in that area. And uh, so I didn't find an advantage <clears throat> in terms of being light-skinned, except it might have been an advantage to get brought into that family because they might have thought that that was nice that they had a light-skinned boy. But I know when we would go places, uh, folk would always look at us because uh, they just thought I didn't belong with them. But, uh, and then I had cousins and stuff that were of all different kind of shades and I had one aunt that was as fair skinned as me, but I didn't have very many that were as fair as me, but you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were light skinned. But now I would go outside that community. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, there's an event that I remember, and this, this will help uh, understand. I was a part of a science fair project in grade school. And I think it was about the fifth grade. And we had a science project and it, it, it was taken to this uh, citywide thing in Kansas City to this uh, uh, citywide uh, science fair thing. And, you know, we, we, we did rather well with it. And we were going to go back to our respective neighborhoods. But we had met at the school and, 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 you know, everybody had to get from home to the school. And then they took us to this place. But it was a big storm that came up. And in, 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 I'm, I'm in Kansas, you know, so they always, when it's a a hard rain, a little hail, they think it might be a tornado. So they wasn't going to bring us back to the school and make us walk home because it was raining. So it was a teacher, and this is all black high school, all black everything. This was, you know, in the 50s. And uh, so the teacher said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take everybody home. So she took all these people home, and she drove, and she was in this neighborhood, and she pulled up to this house, and she said, okay. And I, I said, what? She said, is this where you live? No, ma'am. And she said, aren't you uh, Dr. Henderson's kid's son? I said, no, ma'am. She said, okay. And then she didn't even ask me. She drove to another house. And she thought that was my house in this area. And said, well, you reverend uh, such and such son. I said, no, ma'am. She said, where you live? I said, I live on 3rd Street. She said, huh? I said, 321 Everett. She drove over to where I live, but she just didn't think that I lived there in that neighborhood. And she started locking her door. This is a black woman now. This is all black people. But they were of another class, you understand. They came from a different place. And they came from the South in you know, the migration. And they were teaching us. Because uh, we're in the Midwest. Kansas was considered the Midwest. They considered them. They were going north to get to Kansas. And so, but they, she was locking her doors and stuff. And, and then she got to where my house was. And she was looking around, scared and stuff in the neighborhood she was in. And she let me get out the car. Now, they never asked me to be part of the science fair no more when they found out where I really came from. So I realized that I was probably part of it originally because I was light-skinned. But when they found out what house I come from, what neighborhood I was really from, that I wasn't really that social economic thing, then so I, that was when I first understood the complexity of complexion with our people. Because this ain't about white people. This is about black people. If, you, if I had any advantage with being light-skinned, it wasn't around white people. It was around certain social economic climbing, uh, 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 scarred up consciousness black people. But I never, I never really found, in fact, what I would find about white people is that they would, if they had been to the war or something or had played ball or something with somebody of color, that they came back with assumptions about me. They thought they knew me. They said, well, we know, you know, you think you're better than everybody else, or you think. And it'd be white people saying, I said, well, where are you coming from with this? But they had learned that from some black people who had told them. So anyhow, that's my experience about it.
but it's an individual experience. I ain't saying that, but I know I've run across some uh, people who are very fair skinned, who talk all proper and everything, and I hear some of their opinions and I want to take them out, you know what I mean? Because I'd say, wait a minute, how, where'd that come from? But people live, people come from different houses. That's what them people didn't understand uh, uh, when I was in the, uh, elementary school. People come from different houses and you come out of that house with a different ethic and a different uh, cultural perspective. That's why I always, uh, I think, felt, uh, you know, that I identified with uh, a more uh, uh, union based because as I say the unions and uh, with the, the politics and the stuff of people uh, in the packing houses it was my papa that raised me he was no kin to me but he the man who raised me he worked in a slaughterhouse he worked in a packing house and so and it was segregated packing house but as the union started to build and get stronger they had to make sure that they went across those those uh, uh, racial lines and so what benefited the union, you know, benefited them. So I, I kind of got politicized in that way about the workers. But uh, yeah, so. You need any water or anything while we're talking? Uh, no, I'm good. No. Oh, you got some? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Let me get you that real quick while we cut, cut hold it. Hmm. Well, the first privilege that comes to me of being black is being part of uh, an incredible heritage, great legacy. Uh, to uh, uh, to know yourself, if you know your history, then you know that there's there's a great advantage to being a, a person of color uh, because of the achievements of those who came before you. Now, that's a personal advantage. If you know it, if you don't know it, you don't have that advantage. If you really know where you come from and what you come from with pride and carry yourself that way. If you see an African walking, uh, if, if you see an African at the United Nations walking, you see somebody walking with pride and strength and they, they, they know that they belong in the world. They know that they are a major part of the world. Now, you can go in, in another part of our country and you see a person of color and they don't walk like that. Now, you see some that do because they, they have, you know, whatever money or whatever. But this don't have to do with money if you see that African walking. It's got something to do with, uh, well, you know, the most trusted person on the planet was Nelson Mandela, man. When he walked the earth... When at his funeral, you see the people who came from all over the world. There was no leader that could not come. There were people who never were in the same place with each other until Mandela left the world. And everything that's happening between America and Cuba happened beginning with that. And this pope, the pope that is currently there, he's a monster, man. He, is, he has become an incredible figure because he is the only figure after Mandela left who is asking the heads of state to be that example, to live like Mandela, to do as Mandela was doing. So the world has been, um, has been blessed by Africa in many ways. And if you, but again, as I say, you have an advantage of being black if you know what black is. Now, there are these social things and, and political and economic things, like, you know, they, they, uh, 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 things that are hard won, uh, affirmative action, stuff like that. Now, I've seen it. I kind of I kind of came, I kind of got out of school just as it was being uh, enforced. And uh, but I also saw that before me, there were people like I went to the Juilliard School at one point. And there were folk before me who went before there was anything to do with uh, affirmative action. They went because of the skill level they had. And I tell you something, affirmative action only means that, that if you got a skill level, you should not be eliminated. It don't mean that you give somebody something that they can't handle or that they're not worthy of. 
It means you can no longer keep them away from it, even though they earned it and are worthy of it. That's affirmative action. If you to affirmatively seek the people who are right for this work, who happen to be people of color. Be and the only reason there'd be any is because there was a tradition for years of keeping it from them, of not letting them be all that they could be. So, uh, but it's, it's a double-edged sword, you know, it cut high and it cut low because there are people who make you feel that, well, you know, you really wouldn't be here if it weren't for this. And then there's others who feel that, well, you know, you took it from me because it's really mine, but because of affirmative action, I didn't get it. And all that kind of action. So it comes with a double-edged sword. But uh, uh, the advantage that I see of, 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 uh, of, of being black is that you have the potential to overcome hundreds of years of... Um, inequity and when I and this is why I speak of it as an advantage now an advantage in the workplace uh, you'd have to talk to somebody that's that's that uh, is in the kind of, of, of office or plant kind of work that really knows where the rubber hits the road on that because I you know I've, I've, I've come in university environment I worked in in most Actually, first I worked simply as an artist, as an actor, as you know, a gypsy. So it, when you're a gypsy worker, you're a migrant worker. Uh, you follow the art, you follow the work, you follow the crop. And as a as a a, a, a migrant worker in the arts, um, I, f I found that um, it wasn't for a period of time. It wasn't that great of an advantage because they weren't going to cast certain people in certain roles. Then that changed. They came up with something called non-traditional casting, where they had women that played Hamlet, you know, because they had the skills. They had women that played male roles, I'm saying. And then they had uh, uh, African-Americans who played the King of England, uh, uh, Andre Brower and uh, uh, Denzel, and you know, uh, cats that played uh, all these Shakespearean roles. And uh, Paul Robeson back in the day, he, he played all kinds of roles. Ira Aldrich, the great Ira Aldrich back in the 1800s, was a brother from, uh, from New York who, who played all through Europe. And uh, so we see, we always had these incredible people that did this stuff, uh, but that's in the arts and, it's, and it's, it's like, it's rarefied, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not you know, it's not the same as, as that that workplace that you that you know get up from nine to five in it's it's a different kind of a, a reality. So, uh, but but Paul Robeson is a great example of a man who, although he was incredible and sang in several languages, and and he 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 sang in more languages than he spoke. He spoke several languages. He was a Phi Beta Kappa uh, 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 law student at Columbia and an All-American, it would have been an All-American if they'd have counted it that year. Uh, uh, and, and, he, and he was an actor and all of that, and he got his passport taken away from him because he began to mean so much to uh, people around the world, especially people who were oppressed around the world. So uh, there are these examples of these lives that I say is, is your advantage, if you know it, but if you don't know that, and you really just think that you, you're just a citizen of your street and a citizen of your block, uh, and you, you up against, you fill out your application at that job, and they take it and they put it over there and they say, well, you don't have this, you don't have that, and you don't have that. There ain't no advantage to that. There's no, there's no advantage to that. You mentioned uh, in your speaker series something called America's Defect. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's something that, of all people, uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, who, you know, was a, a Republican, at least last time I checked, she was Republican. But she was in an interview, and she was a Republican, you know, and um, uh, Secretary of State, right? That's Condoleezza. And uh, so after her time, she was interviewed, and they said, don't you see about race relations in America uh, uh, that things have, have, have improved, that things have, have changed? And she said, 
you know, that's an interesting question, she said, because you got to understand something. Things can change. One person can get to be the secretary of state. Another person can get to be this or that. But racism is America's birth defect. And because the country started out with this birth defect, it started out with one of the greatest documents ever written, the Constitution and Declaration of Independence and all that. And it said all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and all that. And at the same time, they enslaved Africans and and literally massacred uh, uh, the native people. And and they had different stratas for people who came from other kind of countries. So you say it's a birth defect. So a birth defect is something that you live with and you compensate for and you do your very best to live a full uh, and, and, and a fulfilling life. But there's no cure for a birth defect. The only cure is the family, your family and friends and the people you work with who adapt to your limitations right and allow you to do uh exceptional stuff uh, 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 but 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 uh, and I, I i said i understood what condoleezza was saying saying that's just brilliant that uh, racism is america's birth defect so but that, that doesn't mean in any way that you give up on something because like helen uh keller uh she said she was too busy celebrating the gifts she had to uh to to meditate long on the gifts that she hadn't and she was she couldn't see, hear or speak. And she achieved incredible stuff and changed the world for all people who couldn't hear or see or speak. So uh, it's, it's not something to roll over on, but it's something to be very realistic about. And then not to think that one election or, 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 or any law is going to stop racism in America. It's a birth defect. Well, like I say, I'm a revolutionary optimist, man. My view on just about everything today at, at the age of 65 with the people and experiences that I've been blessed to have, uh, I'm a revolutionary optimist. I tell you, there's a brother from the Dominican Republic, a barber down in South Carolina on his way to work. And he saw a policeman doing some stuff to a brother and he had his phone and he filmed that stuff. And uh, uh, and he saw he filmed the, 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 the policeman shot the brother, killed him. But he had the courage as a citizen, as an immigrant citizen, because he knew what America meant to him to get out of the Dominican Republic, get over here and be a barber. And I tell you, when I saw the footage on it, brother, his stuff was so clean, man. You should see his hair was sharp. He was sharp, man. Clean as a white fish in a blue ocean. And. And he was afraid, but he took the footage. He walked up to him. He talked to him. Then afterwards, he said he was so afraid. He said, I thought I would de destroy the footage and leave the town. Because he said, I knew when I went down to the police station, I could see where it was, that this was not the America of the books that he had heard about. But. And he said, he said, instead of destroying the footage and leaving town, he did what a, a, a smart American would do. He went and got a lawyer. He took it to a lawyer. And the lawyer took it to the New York Times. And they busted it all wide open. Now, that's what makes me a revolutionary optimist. If a Dominican, a brother from the Dominican Republic, who is an immigrant, and you know, they, they talk about the immigration law, but now, all of these people call themselves Americans. At one time, their family were immigrants. They're not native people. They're not Native Americans. These people, these are immigrant people. You can't even hardly call us immigrant people. We didn't, we didn't decide to build a boat and come over here. But we are Native Americans because our people came here, were born here, all the generations. They're African Americans. And the Africans... American experience is about dealing with America and its problem with others. It's problem with, 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 with racism. But that's the Africans' American experience. And I'm a product of the Africans' American experience. I'm way down the line, you know, as far as the, the complexion thing goes. But, you know, you're black uh, by color, consciousness, and commitment. And uh, 
and uh, uh, consciousness and commitment I got. I might not have black color, but uh, uh, but uh, I got consciousness and commitment. What did, um, Two out of three ain't bad. Right. <laughs> Do you all see a race problem in Buffalo? It's in America, ain't it? Well, let's just talk about Buffalo. Well, I'm saying. Um, When you go through the neighborhood, anytime you can see, see, I guess I, 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 it's difficult for me. When I say a race problem, a race problem is not just a race problem between blacks and whites. Uh, uh, the, the, the racism that causes black on black crime is, an ex, is, is the same racism that, that, that has policemen shooting a young black men and thinking they can get away with it, thinking that black lives don't matter. But there's black people that think black lives don't matter. So when you go through the neighborhood and you see the totems, man, it, almost in the African tradition of the, 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 the things that have been put up, flowers and teddy bears and stuff from childhood, stuff that mothers and fathers have put up on poles and stuff like that. You go through there, man, and you, know, you can't tell what bullet did it. Was it the policeman bullet or was it the, uh, uh, what is his, his a dude he went to grade school with, Bullet, that killed or, or left that person's totem uh, up there on that telephone pole or that tree or that corner, or something like that. So, but uh, uh, the, 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 the race problem in, in Buffalo, I'm, I'm more aware of it like what the brother said about uh, when you don't see all of the people on the construction job. When you, you look at the thing and you say, where, 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 why, why on some of these jobs preventing some of this crime? Why aren't some of these jobs getting some of these brothers off the street? When the money is coming into the area and, 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 and uh, why is there more of it going for that? Now, uh, like um, Ruben Santiago Hudson, uh, a brother whose life is recorded in the Lackawanna Blues um, uh, that he wrote, uh, he's got a culture center out in Lackawanna and and, uh, and it's, it's quite an incredible place, but they need more money so the place can be open at night because there's a whole lot of programs in neighborhoods that stop at like six or seven o'clock in the evening. Well, it's it's after seven o'clock in the evening and a lot of stuff goes down. It would be great to have something for uh, that have enough people to man these places. Uh, later in, in, in the evening, all the way, say, to 10 o'clock at night when they really uh, 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 should be home. And people who work, there really should be people to take care of their children till they get home from work. And there should be places for... So anyway, what, I, what I'm saying about, about, about racism, any advantage that somebody else has to be able to live a full and productive life, people of color should have. Uh, they, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be easier for somebody else's child to go to school and come home safe. Our children got to be able to go to school and come home safe. Uh, it shouldn't be easier for uh, uh, other people to get to their job and get home safe. If the bus if the bus doesn't take them there, you know, it, it's just got to be ways for us to address maximizing the people who are employed and, and on a path of education, and then how to help them, those that are outside of that, the unemployed and those who are not on the path of education. Because I don't put that on, on the government necessarily, um, I, on, on the government alone. I'm saying that's what we're supposed to do for each other. That's how we be us. That's how we be doing it. And um, so to that extent, for all those who have found a way to beat the system, because there is a system. And that's the racism that we're talking about. All of us, you know, say we're talking about this, uh, uh, the, the difficulty getting to live a fulfilling life. And so if we get there, if you know and you got there and you know that, then, you know, I ain't talking about going out and picking up just anybody off the street. I'm talking about your own family. I, just, I know that's why I try to help my, my sister's sons. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the best I can do because it takes a lot to help. But if, if, if we start with our own, uh, it, it'll, it'll make a dent. 
But I don't I don't know racism in Buffalo alone enough to, to be able to speak as as Reverend Pritchard would be able to speak about absolutely specific areas, places, times and so on and so forth. But as a person that covers a lot of the country, I see uh, a lot of buffaloes. Do you think as a, as a whole, <coughs> just white people have it easier than black people? Well, you know, I heard you say a statistic. Um, so when you say on the whole, just in life, yeah, I, I'd have to say, yeah, but it's such a, it's such a useless answer to, I mean, whether they do or not, I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't even know if it's productive to say that because, um, easier I mean, it, it's, 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 it's hard to have an easy life. I mean, to say, you got to do some things. There ain't nobody that gets a check for staying home. So there's some white people that's got more money and more land and more leisure time on the whole than black people have money, land, and leisure time. But there's some very legitimate ways to get that money, land, and leisure time. If they go, if they going out and getting it, you know, now, historically, the advantage that whites have had in this country, I mean, you can't ignore that. I ain't, absolutely. It's a historic advantage to, to being a Caucasian in America. And they, even if, if they want to they cut that up any way they want to cut it up, that's just the truth, man. But now, the Caucasians who are here today and got a job and going and ain't oppressing me, those are good citizens and they're good American citizens. I don't want to cast any aspersions against them. Because some of them have found ways to go and adopt children uh, of this. So I'm saying, uh, I just want to make sure that I don't make a statement that, uh, as true as it may be, it, it it ain't functional. You know what I'm saying? It just ain't functional. Yeah, if the numbers are larger, yeah, they 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 live in they live in large. And uh, I know I've seen it. I mean, they definitely live in live in large, man. I, I most of the time I got introduced to what living large is is be. Man, it was somebody's white white person house. You know what I'm saying? And then I meet a brother and a sister and I say, damn, y'all living like that. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's what is that's who's established this high standard of uh, of American life. Ain't no question about that. I mean, I they, they, they ought to stop. But there are a whole lot of uh of Caucasian people. See, this is that thing. You understand what a capitalistic system? The money is in the hands of the few at the top. So it's a whole lot down here. That's why when you start talking about percentages, you gotta be really knowing what you're talking about. Say, well, 53% of white people think that this about black people. Well, I don't care what 53% of white people feel about very much or nothing. I don't care what 53% of any people care about anything because I gotta get my own answers to things. I can't be, I can't be living because of 53% of the people's opinion. Just so that's over their opinion. But now, if 50% of any population is set against me, and make sure that I can't have a fulfilling life, then I got, to, I, got to, I got issue with them. But the issue with them having a poll and taking a poll, that's why they try to play us like that with the elections and stuff. In the last three days of the election, somebody come out with a story that can't nobody cover and find the truth out, and people reactionary go to the polls and vote because they heard that 53% of the people said some stuff. I'm pleased. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I want to make sure that my people, I want to make sure that my people have a chance to do all the things that they really put their back to. Everything that they're willing to put their back to, to go and do, I want them to have it. And I really want everybody else's people to have the same advantage because that makes the street safer for my children and my people because if people are productive if america works america works if americans have work america works and uh, you know i mean that's what i that, that's what i've observed what um how did you feel about the lightning project um you know when i saw it and i thought they they gotta have their say. They can't have their way, but but they gotta have their say. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Can you just repeat the question for 
Oh, the whiteness project. Yeah. Well, you know, when I when I when I I saw uh, uh, excerpts from it and, and some of the statements and pictures and the people of the whiteness project and some of the things that they said. And I thought. Uh, they that person has to have his or her say. They really do have to have that say because they feel like they're pressured and they're, they feel like they're uh, 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 um, disenfranchised. And and they got to have their say. They can't have their way. Everybody can't have their way, but they can have their say. Uh, and and one of the one of the contracts with America that Americans have is I got to be willing to let. Uh, in order for me to have my rights, I got to be willing to let somebody else have their rights. So uh, uh, I understood that that they felt the need to have to say that. And, but I took uh, uh, great notice of the whites who said, I don't feel that uh, uh, I have had a uh, difficult time. Uh, that, uh, there's some who said, I don't even feel like I've been identified or that I, did. I don't identify myself as white. Well, there's black people. I, I meet black people all the time, you know, when they say uh, uh, I'm, I'm mixed raced, you know, and I say, OK, all right. But that's that's their but they got to say that's what they had to say. That's not my story. Uh, so I felt about the, the, the whiteness project that uh, that th there was a place for it. What I what I was the reason I responded to this project and wanted to be a part of it, because I thought that there was a part of this that could facilitate a healing for any dissension that that project had. In other words, you got to have a dialogue going on. The best thing uh, would be for either, you know, the two filmmakers or all the people in that project study and the people in this project study. But let them sit down and talk to each other. So then you got a dialogue going on because otherwise you got, you know, this because I'm, I'm not speaking in reaction to the whiteness project. I'm speaking in response to some filmmakers who I think a lot of and I think that they, they've got something that they want to do. So uh, my my uh, my impotence is not versus something. My impetus is uh, is to to be a part of of some bridge building or some healing. with the white person and like kind of be honest with them about how you really feel or do you feel yourself sugarcoating certain things? No, I feel like I feel like I can. I because I can because first of all I'm close to retirement. I got my pension. They can't take nothing out of my pocket. I mean this is straight up and down what it is, but there are people there have been times in my life when I knew that I could not speak as I wanted to and go home and, and pay the rent and 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 do my part in the house, you know what I mean? Because uh, uh, I had a wife that was out there in the world coming back and, 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 and bringing stuff in, and I had to do my part. Uh, so I did, there, there are times that I did not feel like I could, nor, nor did I feel, uh, see, because the thing was, what was more important to me was raising my family than uh, pleasing or displeasing that employer. But I knew that in order to, continue to have employment, it'd be better if I did not bring up that particular subject. But now, anytime something raises its head that is a matter of, of, of dignity, whether you can walk away from, to speak truth to power, that's different. Anytime the issue come up, I, I always felt like I had to make a stand because of where I come from and, and, and what I didn't want people to think of me. You know, cause, because I was fair skinned and stuff, sometime I might have jumped out there and got all stronger than I, you know, you know, people say, hey man, be cool, be cool. Like, no, I ain't gonna be cool, you know, cause I want folk to know that I don't go there. But, uh, um, but now I don't feel like I have to do that. Cause if you ask me the question, I'm gonna be who I am today. I don't feel like I have to mince my words 
with anybody uh, uh, today. Let me, um, so in, in 2015, do you think we are still affected uh, from slavery? Unfortunately, the answer to, in, 20, in 2015, we are still feeling the residue of an uh, unjust uh, system. Um, Dr. Ben Johannan, who just passed away not long ago, one of the great, great scholars who said that there's an unbroken psychological chain from slavery. And that psychological chain is hooked to the white man and to the black man. And the white man has an unbroken psychological chain that makes him think he's superior. And some black people have an unbroken psychological chain that make them think that they are victims. Not that they're inferior, but they are victims. They have a victim mentality because they have been victimized. And that's the unbroken psychological chain. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, people are walking around some white people are walking around feeling superior and some black people walk around feeling like victims and um, it's, it's still felt. So when you say superior, then you say victim. Isn't the opposite of superior and inferior? Yeah, but I'm not talking about opposites. I'm talking about what psychological residue is left from slavery. It's not about opposites. It's about the unbroken psychological chain of superiority is the residue left from slavery in the white man because he was in superior position. Black people have gotten over to a great extent inferiority because they never felt they were. Black people, white people thought they were inferior. Black people knew that they were enslaved, okay? Black, there was a lot of black people that never felt inferior. They felt enslaved and that's being victimized. But now white people said that they were enslaving them because they were inferior. But the psychological chain that's left with black, white people is superiority and the residue of being a victim, having been a victim, because we were victimized by slavery. And some people ain't out of it and they, everything they think, they, they turn and they look and they see it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a victim kind of a, you know, uh, of a thing. And sometimes it makes them fight really, really, really hard. And sometimes it makes them roll over and say, well, you know, I can't do it because, you know, like that. But sometimes it makes them fierce. Like some crime is revolutionary crime. There's some people who, 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 who are criminals on a high level and they are always stealing from the people in the system who got the most money. Then there's some criminal, criminal acts that happened in the neighborhood that people stealing from people who ain't got no more than they got. There ain't nothing revolutionary about that, nothing at all. But it all, some of it is, you know, is residue from being a victim. A lot of it is still residue from being a victim. How do you feel about reparations? Do black people deserve reparations? Um, I honestly do believe that you can see the population out there that require reparations to get themselves back on their feet. They're there. They're, they're in these overpopulated prisons. They're in uh, some uh, nefarious stuff in the street. But the, the main ones that I think that are entitled to reparations are those who are incarcerated. Some of them uh, uh, for victimless crimes, some of them some of them just the wrong person doing the time and some of them doing the time because they did the crime, but they did the crime because of a disadvantage from childhood. So if there's reparations that are deserved, it's, it's where it's needed. Um, I don't need no reparations. Uh, I know I know I know a lot of people, a lot of black people who are doing fine for themselves and they do not need no reparations. But there are black people who need and deserve reparations because they are the worst victims uh, generationally, that they may come from five, six generations of people who have never moved past the poverty level. Those people deserve reparations because of what labor and stuff that their forebears did uh, to build this country. But as far as just, you know, giving a whole lot of money, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't, th it's not about whether it's right or wrong, really. It's about, is it productive? Is it, is there a healing involved in giving some money to all African-American people? I, 
I don't know. I, that one, I don't think so. But I do know that I see the victims of people, uh, people out there who really do deserve uh, uh, some, some, uh, some money being put forth to get them, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they've been broken. They've been broken. And it's, it's, it's better to put money into children and make sure they don't get broken because it costs a whole lot of money to fix somebody once they are broken. And uh, that's the reparations that I see. Even if like white people see it now and say, well, why would somebody deserve reparations for something that happened so long ago? It didn't affect them today. So a lot of, I've seen even watching those interviews, they feel like they had nothing, them, those certain white people that are interviewed had nothing to do with slavery. So why are they being held at the cross as if they did something and then black people who are not successful today, it's their own fault is what they would say. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty much like, no, I see what you're saying. You uh, know what I, mean? I do. Uh, it's, it's a lot of terms. Um, like we all earthlings. We're in charge of the earth. We're destroying the earth. We need the earth. Our children need the earth. We can't save the earth for our children and not save it for them. Now, this is the same thing I would say to those white people. You are an American. There is this is America. These people are here. Now, the reparations that I'm talking about that I say go to, uh, to some of the that 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 I think should go to uh, to get this prison situation uh, 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 to at least. I mean, it's just a really ridiculous numbers of people incarcerated and a ridiculous number of them are people of color. And I include Latin uh, people, too. Uh, cause, because slavery is another form of the way that people were exploited by the robber barons and the people who own all the stuff. The worker got exploited. And slavery is the worst way that a worker is exploited because he don't get paid at all. But there are people who worked, who got pennies for that, and if they got an arm broken or a leg or something, then they say, you can't work no more, you just throw them away. So I'm saying, these, these reparations make it a better America for everybody. Now, I could see if white people were to jump in and say, well, wait a minute. If the basis of, of, of what Henderson is saying about reparations is this, then we got some people that need to get some too. Fine, absolutely fine. If you can prove that your, your people for generations have been staying above the poverty, I mean, below the poverty level from slavery all the way to today, and you can and you can show that y'all just po whites, y'all going to okie doke, you living in a trailer and thinking that you voting for the person that's going to make you and you still in the trailer. You if you're trying to get out of that cycle of poverty, uh, because that's what I think about the, about the reparation. But I'm proud. See, I'm, I'm so proud that under all the circumstances that were put in front of our way, as, as Martin would say, in, in spite of interposition and nullification and all the obstacles, that we got people who have really achieved, man, and made it and done stuff. And I'm, I'm so proud of that. Uh, and and, and, and uh, so, but I understand the people who weren't able to do it. Everybody can't do it. Everybody didn't have whatever it took to get that stand, to help get there, everybody didn't have it. So I think that, yeah, I would, I would, I would say, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a reason for a one-time reparation to help uh, 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 get this prison situation. The people who have been the most victimized by, and I hate to say that capitalism, see, because people go, well, man, you, you against capitalism. I ain't against capitalism, but we have to have some sort of a socialist approach to humanity to help other people. And, and we gotta start with our own and set an example for everybody else. But you know, there, there are people who will tell you in a minute, you know, uh, white people take care of their own. Uh, you know, Jewish people, they do for their own, man. Are we doing for ourselves? Well, there's, there are, all those things exist. We do for ourselves, they do for themselves. But there are people who fall below the cracks. They really are. There are people who have fallen below. And that's the only place that I think that uh, 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 reparations are supposed to go. But I mean, my opinion, man, you know, I don't have to have my way, I just got to have my say. I'm glad that y'all give a, 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 you know, a place for people to say what they had to say. Do you, do you think white men are scared of black men? Well, white people in general are scared of black men? 
I think that, yeah, I, th oh, <laughs> I think that there are some people who are really afraid of the young black men and women because there's some women in gangs out here the fierce, but they, they have seen beat downs up. See, when people see people beat their own people, when people see a group of women in a joint kick and beat a woman up, and they say, man, you know, when they consider, if they ever get that stuff right to come at, come at me. So yeah, they have fear. There's people who are afraid of, of a, a whole generation of young black uh, 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 men and women because they're afraid because they, they say, well, if that had happened to me, how would I feel? Cause so they got a they got a feeling that uh, yeah they're afraid they're afraid there's some people who are very much afraid and uh, and I think there's some who are afraid and concerned that there's some who are afraid and because they're afraid they seize every opportunity to limit the numbers and I really do think so this is a, a group of people I really do think that because they are afraid and they don't know what to do when they are in a situation where they are in authority and they have a weapon that they are making very terrible fatal decisions about black lives because they are afraid. Now there's some who are afraid and concerned. So there's some who are afraid and, and, and are saying, we gotta do something about this situation other than just try to make the numbers go down. But yeah, there are people who, are, uh, who, who see a kid in a Halloween uniform, a costume or something, and they're afraid, man. They see him with a toy gun and they shoot, they're afraid. And, I, and, 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 and that fear, to some, for some of them, they turn, that fear turns into a war zone kind of a mentality, that, that we're, we're at war with these young people. This is a war out here. And they are taking them down. There are some who are afraid and they are trying their very best to join with other folk to do something uh, constructive with those lives. Well, also, listen, we're talking about um, a race of people. See, see, when, you, when, we, when we start to do this, just say, okay, black, white, we do this. But we, you can find examples throughout history, man, of stuff that whites have done that will make us very afraid of them. That so, yeah, they know what they're capable of. There are white people who are, there are people, I think, white and black and, and, and Asian and everything, that, that are trying to evolve to become the best they can be. And there are other folk who are only going by the examples of history and they are saying, the only way we have survived in the past is to take out some people. So, I mean, you know, uh, this thing is so many tiered and so many leveled. It's got so many things to it that it is not as simple to, to make a pun in this circumstance. It's just not as simple as black and white. The nature of humans, it has to do with the nature of human beings. Uh, they, they say that Dr. King said at one time that he first felt that the heart of man was basically good. And that that was almost like one of the tenets and foundations of, of, of his Christian faith, that the heart of mankind is basically good. After viewing some stuff and seeing it a little closer, he said, no, I was wrong. The heart of man is a clean slate. And whereupon what you write on it, that's what you get. So if you write on a child's slate, if you whip that child and you burn that child with cigarettes, if you, if you brutalize a child, the child will brutalize others. And that brutalization will go on. So people are not basically good or bad people are basically a clean slate and what you what you write upon that slate that's what you're gonna get back so there are human beings black white and everything who are violent uh hedonistic all that kind of stuff so we got we, we can't just fix 
one race of, and we can't address, you know, one race of people, man. We can't. We can't. We've got to address it on a larger level than that. Or we'll be doing pinch, we'll be doing this forever, you know, black, white, black, white, pinch, ouch, pinch, ouch. You know, I mean, sooner or later, we got to try to just, you know, I don't know. I don't want to sound, you know, too uh, idealistic, but we got to try to heal the human heart. Because uh, uh, you know and I know good people of all kinds. You know and I know all kind of good people. We just got to try to figure out how that happened and, and, uh, and, and duplicate it in children's lives. Give them some positive experiences. Let's try to, let's try to get the odds in our favor. In the, in, in, the, in the favor of the earthlings. All right. All right. Yeah. Hey.